All right, welcome back. We have, um, we've been joined today by Stephanie Seguino, who's here to um, talk about S232. It kind of fits hand in glove a little bit um, with the noted differences between what we just heard about H273. Um, so I would just go right ahead and say, Stephanie, welcome to General Housing and Military Affairs. Um, just introduce yourself and who you're affiliated with and, and the microphone is yours. Great, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I'm Stephanie Seguino, I'm a professor of economics at the University of Vermont. Um, I teach uh, macroeconomics, uh, which is a lot related to national economic policy. And I also teach on race and gender inequality. Uh, I, the bill I, I know is about not only limited access to land ownership, but also housing. And so I'm going to talk about the housing component of this, uh, although there certainly is a lot, a lot to say nationally with regard to uh, exclusion of people of color from land ownership as well as expropriation of land. Uh, I want to just preface it by saying that I'll pro provide some national data and some Vermont data, but the Vermont data has been more limited. Uh, my experience, uh, many of you may know that I do research on racial profiling by the police in Vermont. And what we see nationally exists here in Vermont. And uh, so although it would be great to have Vermont specific data, in reality, many of the national trends are likely to exist here as well. I wanna just start out by talking why I think that the issue of home ownership is fundamental. And quite frankly, that relates to land ownership as well. And that is for most families in the United States, housing equity is one of the most important components of their wealth portfolio. Uh, it's an, a vehicle for um, getting loans. Uh, so to generate the collateral, to get loans for sending your kids to college, to starting a new business, and also to transmit wealth to uh, intergenerationally. Uh, and it is especially important for folks of color uh, to have access to housing because that is one of the more important mechanisms for wealth generation uh, as compared to, let's say, white families uh, and spe specifically. Uh, and so I have some statistics here for you. For Blacks in the United States, housing is 63% of their net worth compared to 38.5% for whites. And one of the reasons for that is for many whites, uh, we have very unequal distribution of wealth and income in the United States. And for many people, their wealth comes not just from home equity, but ownership of stocks and bonds and other financial assets. Uh, and that white inequality, the inequality that we see in the United States, if we look at the top 10, 20% is do predominant, predominantly white. And that's why you see this difference in the role of house, uh, home equity in terms of the wealth portfolio. Uh, looking at Vermont, what you can see is that Vermont has, uh, uh, that whites in Vermont are actually very similar to the national average of roughly 72% own their homes and therefore build equity, build a wealth portfolio through their homes compared to only 24% of blacks in Vermont. And this is significantly below the national average where black uh, home ownership rates um, are roughly 42%. So in that sense, Vermont actually fares much worse than other states. Uh, some recent data from Mayor Weinberger when he did his State of the City address a few days ago was to note that out of 6,000 uh, 6, owner-occupied homes in Burlington, only 17 are Black-owned. Now, I, just to, for those of you not aware of the statistics, Blacks are roughly 7 to 8% of Burlington's population. So we would expect, absent the impact of race, that Blacks would also own 7 to 6% uh, I'm sorry, roughly seven to eight percent of homes in Burlington, but in fact, they are just 0.3 percent of home owners. Um, and this is uh, just some data for you on wealth and why uh, what the one of the issues around home ownership and wealth inequality is that uh, wealth in the United States is very unequally distributed, uh, as is income. So although blacks have roughly 60% of the income of whites, they, their uh, wealth relative to white median family wealth is roughly 7%. And I have a note here uh, that you can see that this gap is, 
is large in part due to federal policy practice in the 20th century. And I will talk much more about that as I go through these data. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a, a, a brief sort of a brief history, if you will, uh, of uh, what has led to housing discrimination and ultimately wealth inequality in the United States. And uh, in particular, I'm going to talk about several vehicles through which this occurred. Uh, the, and I'm going to just kind of say a few things here and I'll go through some of these in a bit more detail. Um, much of what we see in terms of housing discrimination in the United States is largely a function of government policy. Uh, there is personal discrimination, if you will, institutional discrimination, but government, the role of government in the United States has been pivotal in leading us to the wealth inequality and exclusion of Blacks and Hispanics in particular from land ownership as well as housing ownership. And I'm gonna talk for a few minutes about uh, the FHA, the Federal Housing Authority, and its role in redlining. Uh, the GI Bill, which was a, a major component of lack of access to housing. Uh, urban renewal and highways, I'm not gonna say too much about, but I'll, I'll answer a question if you have about it, as well ex as exclusionary zoning. So those, those four are actually uh, housing inequality and discrimination driven by government policy. And um, then there are other components of that, which is restrictive covenants and steering, blockbusting, and mob violence uh, as well in the United States. And so we think of that as more happening at a personal level, if you will, or in these institutions other than government. And I'll talk briefly about those. So with regard to redlining, um, uh, the FHA, uh, began a process of, uh, of uh, which was established in 1934, began a process of regulating the terms uh, interest rates and mortgage terms after the banking crisis of the 1930s. And what the FHA did was essentially say that it would begin to insure mortgages so, uh, and, and, uh, to qualified lenders. And this protected mortgage lenders from default. So it incentivizes lenders to loan to particular households. Uh, and when government guarantees these loans, it means that they also come at a lower interest rate because that lowers the risk to banks to lend to those households, knowing that the government will cover that risk. Uh, and of course, uh, in fact, that was what I just said, the, the slide here that if the borrower, borrower fails to make their payment, uh, the FHA was, uh, would, be, uh, would cover the unpaid balance. Uh, and so what happened as a result of the establishment of the FHA and these guidelines is that the FHA surveyed uh, various neighborhoods, especially in larger cities, but smaller as well, and graded the neighborhoods based on uh, a color coding system in which green was best, that is higher income, uh, for example, and, uh, and white. Uh, there were uh, neighborhoods that were designated blue for still desirable, uh, yellow for definitely declining. And what that meant was that those neighborhoods were neighborhoods that were integrating. And finally, red, uh, red line neighborhoods were those that were considered hazardous, and they were the neighborhoods that were predominantly people of color. Uh, and so what happened, as you can see, this map on the left is uh, from Macon, Georgia, and it was an example of the uh, FHA maps that uh, banks used in order to allocate mortgage lending. Uh, and uh, you can see the predominantly the red areas were largely neighborhoods of color. Uh, and uh, those are the neighborhoods that were excluded from loans. And it is interesting today that these, uh, these, this, this residential segregation of this kind that we see still persists. Uh, so the FHA, I, I, I want to continue to emphasize this because I think it is fundamentally related to the bill that you're taking testimony on, and that is the role of government in creating the, um, the, the inequality that we see today in terms of wealth inequality and lack of access to land and housing. Uh, another component of this historically was what we know euphemistically as the GI Bill. It was called the Servicemen's Readjustment Act. Uh, when servicemen were coming back from World War II, there was a concern that they would face a lack of housing. And so the GI Bill uh, funded higher education. It also funded unemployment benefits and housing. 
Uh, and uh, in many cases, black service members were uh, either met with resistance in accessing these benefits or denied altogether. So this was a major moment in US history. There have been several moments, but this was a, another major moment in which the government leveraged uh, access to housing for a particular racial group, and that is white people, and excluded people of color, but in particular, uh, black members of our society. So those are some of the, so the uh, I, I mentioned uh, urban renewal and highways. Those uh, projects were often uh, designed to it further segregate uh, neighborhoods of color from white neighborhoods. So you, you go to New Orleans or other places, you will see uh, that the highways divide these, uh, these, these neighborhoods from white neighborhoods where the employment is, where the amenities are and so forth. And if any of you are familiar with Biden's infrastructure bill, one of the components of his infrastructure bill is to reconnect these neighborhoods that had been divided uh, by, by uh, urban renewal in particular. So in, a, in addition to the role of government, there was also of course the role of the real estate industry uh, during that period of time or community groups, white community groups in particular, which developed uh, racially restrictive covenants uh, that were covenants that were part of the, uh, the, the, the deed that owners would sign in which it would pro prohibit them from selling their home, leasing their home, or renting their property to particular groups of people, including African Americans. Uh, and so what this was one of the mechanisms of residential segregation. Uh, people of color who wanted access to amenities and good schools and so forth were prohibited from moving into their neighborhoods. And for many years, these were legally uh, enforceable contracts uh, and it was not the terribly distant future in which these were ruled as, uh, as, as uh, unconstitutional or a violation of, of, uh, of equal protection. Uh, and the racial covenants that, uh, sorry, the restrictive covenants really began in the 1920s with the great migration northwards, north. And so uh, we often in this state think of racism as being a Southern phenomenon but this was deeply a Northern phenomenon to create these racial covenants, which is not to say that they don't exist, uh, did not exist in the South, they certainly uh, did. Uh, another mechanism that was used and uh, quite frankly is still used today is steering by real estate agents and developers. And uh, the mechanism for this is fairly straightforward. And that is that they guide prospective buyers to certain neighborhoods based on their race. Uh, this is illegal under the Fair Housing Act of 1968, but it still happens. And I'll just share with you that uh, when I was first on the job market in 1995 looking for a home, I was offered a, an academic position in North Carolina. And uh, when I was looking for housing, in fact, the chair of the economics department took me to a neighborhood and assured me that people of color would not be shown homes in that neighborhood. Uh, so this is prevalent today. I don't have any information uh, on its occurrence in Vermont, but I will provide you some Vermont data which will help you understand some things about Vermont. Uh, Blockbusting was an, a, a method that had been used in the past as well. And uh, it was often engaged in by real estate uh, brokers who would manipulate white homeowners from selling their, to, to selling their homes at a lower price by convincing them that racial minorities were about to move into their neighborhood. And uh, why would they leave? It wasn't necessarily that they didn't want to live with people of color, but because home values would decline uh, as the neighborhood became more diverse. And uh, so this is an example of what a real estate agent would do. They might hire a black woman to walk through the neighborhood with her, um, with a, a carriage perhaps. And then the agent would um, place a, a real estate agent's card in the mailbox and encourage that folks to contact him if they would like to sell. Uh, and so again, this was a, a mechanism. Uh, this was actually a profit-driven mechanism. Uh, these real estate brokers would uh, 
buy low and sell high. So in many cases, when black families and Hispanic families gained access to these neighborhoods, they actually paid a significant premium uh, uh, as a result of these practices. So uh, what I was describing to you is in many ways is, is 20th century housing discrimination, which was the attempt was to address that through the Fair Housing Act in the United States in 1968. Uh, but many communities have responded to this in a variety of ways. And so we see what I, I would say is slightly more disguised mechanisms of discrimination. Uh, they uh, nevertheless continue to exist. One of those is zoning uh, and in particular exclusionary zoning. So in, in uh, the post 1917 period, um, many uh, communities hired planning professionals that would uh, develop zoning laws that were legally defensible, but were exclusionary, that were meant to, uh, that were meant to exclude various sorts of people. Uh, in particular, what was often used was to require that neighborhoods consist exclusively of single family uh, units or that there be a minimum lot size, for example. So that this was really not only a racial mechanism to include people, but also socioeconomic. Uh, and you know, I live here in Burlington and, and I live in the Hill section, which is largely zoned for single family houses. And it's not surprising that it's one of the least diverse neighborhoods in, uh, in Burlington. Uh, and I, I might add that exclusionary zoning was in particular used in the Northeast of the United States. Well, I, one of the things that this is sort of a byproduct, when I talk about the segregation tax, it is a byproduct of housing discrimination. Uh, and it is a factor that has led to wealth disparity in the United States. So it's not so much a policy, but a result of the other policies. Um, the segregation tax that people of color pay is, uh, is, is related to the fact that homes appreciate more sl slowly in segregated or racially changing neighborhoods. Uh, and in particular, once more than 10% of a neighbor, one's neighbors are black, the evidence has shown us that home values decline. And this is largely uh, because of the unwillingness of white people to live in diverse neighborhoods. Uh, and so we can see that is often why blockbusting worked was that the anticipation that if people of color moved into the neighborhood, that home values would plummet. And so white families would sign on to, you know, we'd call a real estate agent to uh, sell their homes if they thought the neighborhood was changing for fear of the value of their home declining. Uh, but so what this means is that houses that are identical in quality in white neighborhoods versus diverse neighborhoods are actually have very different values because of white prejudice with regard to integration. And so we call this gap in values, uh, the segregation tax that is paid for by black homeowners and Hispanic homeowners. This doesn't really give you the full array of the impact of, um, of the race, racialized housing practices that we've had in the United States, uh, for example, uh, there's been a great deal of exclusion of people of color from owning a home uh, for a variety of different reasons, uh, discriminatory reasons. And because of that, they fail to get the benefit, for example, of the mortgage, uh, uh, mortgage interest rate tax deduction or the property interest rate tax deduction. So if we were to calculate uh, the full breadth of the segregation tax, it would actually be much higher than what it is. Um, so this is uh, something that has come to my attention more recently that I had not been aware of and is getting increasing attention. This is an article in the New York Times, but you will see that there are actually numerous uh, articles and a lot more research on this later. And that is the, uh, the role of uh, home appraisals in devaluing the homes that are owned by people of color. Uh, in this particular example, uh, the homeowner's uh, house was appraised and uh, because its value was too low, he, uh, he conducted an experiment in which he had his white neighbor uh, welcome the appraisal agent 
and removed any evidence that there was a black family living there, such as photographs and so forth. And the value of the home increased by roughly 25%. I shouldn't say the value, the appraised value increased by roughly 25%. So again, this is a, another mechanism by which we get, um, we get wealth inequality in the United States. Uh, another aspect of uh, assessing, if you will, the impact of racism on access to housing and home ownership is through housing audits. Uh, and so uh, I wanna just tell you about these because I do have some data for you with regard to Vermont. Uh, housing audits oftentimes, uh, it, you know, it can depend on whether you're looking at actual uh, owning a home or rental housing. But what, what housing audits are, and I will just add that we do this in jobs as well now, in which you match pairs of people, a person of color and a white person. Uh, the pair is equally qualified for the housing in terms of their credit scores and so forth. And they're also trained to have wear the same kind of clothing, uh, you know, speak the same way, have many of the same characteristics. So they're matched pairs and the only difference is meant to be their race when they go to uh, uh, acquire about an advertised housing unit. So they each apply either for rental housing or want to be shown a house or make a bid for a house. And what they find is that minority auditors are given significantly less favorable treatment than their equally qualified teammates. Uh, and I, what is, I think, striking about this is that this is one of the few pieces of data that we do have Vermont. This is a study that came out in 2011 by Vermont Legal Aid, in which they did two types of housing audits. They did telephone response audits, so they would call in response to an ad, um, and they also did in-person visits. And the uh, study is in the notes to this PowerPoint, which I'll share with you all. And it looks not only at race, but also native language and some other things like disabilities. So uh, it's, I think, well worth looking at. And what they find is basically 30 to 40% uh, of uh, the, in these 40, 30 to 40% of paired tests that there was discrimination against the tester of color and there was preference shown towards white testers. So Vermont is, is not immune to some of these, uh, some of these practices. Um, I would say that one of the areas that I have looked for, uh, I'm on the racial equity advisory panel and, and have brought this issue up and I think it's one that Vermont should monitor more heavily and that is lending discrimination. Uh, their uh, banks are required to keep data on their loan applications and nationally, the data tell us that uh, when you look at equally qualified white and black applicants, black applicants tend to be turned down for loans at a much higher rate than white applicants. And they're much more likely not to be given a reason for which their loan is denied. This, uh, in, the, in the 2011 study, I did find, however, that um, Vermont is one of the few states in the, in the country in which black applicants actually have a higher approval rating for loans than do white applicants. And uh, as you can see here, it's 96% uh, of Vermont applicant, uh, black applicants are, have their loans approved compared to 90% for whites. Uh, Idaho, uh, Hawaii, and Montana also have higher black rates. This was 10 years ago. Uh, I think that the Great Recession may have had an impact. I do not think we monitor this, and I think this is fundamentally important, uh, especially in this bill. For the, uh, for the work of this, uh, of this entity. I think this is important for that work for them to undertake as a part of the process of ensuring equitable access to land and housing. We also know, however, that even if Blacks uh, have uh, maybe as likely to get approved for loans, that they also pay higher interest rates. And I might just add, this is on car loans, as well as housing loans and so forth. Uh, but in any case, 20% uh, of loans to Blacks were considered higher priced uh, as defined by government as compared to 7% of loans to non-Hispanic whites. And uh, the definition of higher price I've shown here, which means that annual uh, percentage rates are significantly higher than the average prime rate. 
So what that does is, of course, is it discourages Black home ownership. Uh, and lastly, I want to just refer to what happened during the Great Recession as a more recent event of housing discrimination. Uh, prior to the Great Recession, uh, from what I've just said, you can understand that Blacks and Hispanics were super excluded from access to quality housing and home ownership. But uh, in the run-up, to the period prior to the Great Recession, they were super included as people who were targeted for predatory, predatory lending. And by that, I mean uh, deceptive lending practices such as uh, you know, undisclosed balloon payments, uh, 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 adjustable mortgage interest rates that jumped dramatically after a year or two and so forth. And, and there is, I think it's widely accepted amongst economists that not only financial institutions, but in particular, government bore responsibility for the decimation, in fact, of home ownership amongst families of color because of their failure to regulate the financial, uh, financial institutions that were doing the lending. So all of this comes to my last point, which is that uh, government policies, uh, not necessarily individuals with personal uh, racial animus, but government policies were instrumental in leading to the inequality in land and home ownership that we experience today in the United States and certainly as well as Vermont. Uh, and so uh, uh, I think that the bills that have been addressed, uh, both H-232 and H-273, are, um, are bills that could move us from harm of government policies where there has been a pattern and practice of racially discriminatory policies to one of repair. And uh, I'm very much in support of both of these bills. I, I wanna, would like to just make just a few brief comments on them, uh, which is that I appreciate their attention to diverse membership in terms of representation of BIPOC folks on the boards. Uh, but I, I, I have been doing this work a long time, and I want to just say that uh, that can easily turn into tokenism if there are not also commitments to actual impact. And that may be goals in terms of percentages of lending uh, or set-asides, but that ultimately, if these bills are to be effective in the goals that you've articulated, what is important is not simply representation of BIPOC folks, but actually uh, creating goals that the, these entities will be responsible for, accountable for achieving uh, in the work that they do. Thank you. I'll stop sharing my screen. On your last point, thank you, Stephanie. Um, on your last point regarding tokenism, it's um, it's kind of a, an important word in a lot of what we do. We don't usually use it, um, but that idea of of um, I guess I guess I would ask you to talk a little bit more about that because it when we're talking about changes in the way we do things, we're being asked to 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 center BIPOC in the work that we're doing and um, much of the work that we're doing, if we do it right, really won't be known for some time, right? Because you're changing a culture as long, you know, you're not just assigning people to a task force or to a committee to hand out grants or anything like that. It is an attempt to start a cultural change, which requires sustainability and, and everything else. But can, can you just re return to that word again and just, and, and just it, cause it's, it's jarring. It's a jarring word. Um, yeah. And it makes an impact on how, how we think about our work. Like we can't just say, oh, look what we did. Isn't that great? Yeah. Um, I'm gonna just share with you my experience from, you know, being in, um, in administration at UVM uh, and trying to advance issues around equity and inclusion and a number of organizations that I've been part of uh, in watching this work. What I find is that if you appoint one or two people of color to a large body, 
those, those, that small number of people bears an in, inordinate burden of uh, changing the climate and culture. And it can be intimidating. Uh, so I think that you need a critical mass of people of color in any group in order to protect those who might speak up or who might feel intimidated from not speaking up. Um, and uh, and I, I, I want, you know, now I'm wondering if I should have used that word. I think I'm, uh, when I use that word, I'm really uh, reflecting my experience at the University of Vermont, which has, you know, uh, you know commissions on racial equity, uh, you know, a whole bunch of diversity stuff, but it actually is tokenistic. And, you know, I would say that UVM has made virtually zero progress in the 25 years that I've been there. Uh, but they have a diversity and equity um, vice provost and so on and so forth. So, uh, so I see that in other organizations in which by virtue of having uh, selected a person of color or two to be in their, you know, on their boards or whatever, that they feel that they've done the work. But it is very hard for a person of color, and I'll just say somebody who's African-American and what is otherwise an all white board to, um, to withstand resistance within the group. And so you either need to have a critical mass of people, you need to have a critical mass of people for those voices to actually be heard. Uh, but also, I think it also takes, uh, the, one of the issues with that is also that um, people tend to look therefore at the people of color who are on these boards to carry the water for the group. And the reality is that everybody has to be all in on these goals. And so that's why I say that what you really, the way you have to measure your success is not representation around who's making decisions, but what's the impact of those decisions. Um, I, I hear you on the fact that some of this work is, um, is, is long-term and that impacts are not easy to measure in the short period of time, but there does, there do need to be measure, you do need to be able in some way to say that your, 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 your board or your entity is making progress. Uh, and it can't be simply that you have greater diverse representation in terms of um, decision-making. No, it's a, um, there's more to that too. I mean, just the support of boards for, I mean, if you hire executive director, a person of color, and then don't support them when they, tell you from their perspective where the organization needs to change uh, you know there's there's all of that too you know just from you, you know do you hire somebody and then not support them is 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 that worse than not hiring them in the first place i think um is a constant worry at least institutionally um a couple of questions here representative murphy then kalaki thank thank you chair stevens i really appreciated this presentation and and just would ask Stephanie if this is something you could um, offer your slide group to our um, committee assistant so that we can have it on our document page to refer back to. There was a lot in it and it was really of great value because you referenced Burlington, you, you brought it closer to home than some of what we get the opportunity to, to review. So thank you. I'd be happy to, sure. Representative Kalecki. Thank you, Chair, and hello, Stephanie. Hi. I'm a, I followed your and loved your work for a long time and you've thank done you. a great work. Uh, so thank you for all of this. Um, I'm, I'm interested that your work has really been centered about the disparities for um, African-Americans in our communities and in a number of different ways, the traffic stop study and all, all the different things you've done, which I appreciate. Um, are there similar studies that we can also look at to see about the Latinx experience or the Asian experience or the indigenous experience so that we um, understand um, throughout the state what the systemic issues are? You know, that's a great question. And so I, first of all, I wanna just say that I think that's important to do. And uh, there are several challenges. Uh, so, let me just say a couple of uh, things. I, I think that the Vermont Legal Aid study that I referenced yes. includes other racial groups. Okay, good. And that's worth looking at. Thank you. Nationally, um, uh, a number of scholars have been working on wealth inequality 
and have done some major studies of cities like Boston and LA and so forth. And I think they're microcosms of the rest of the country. And they, and they often, uh, most of the stuff I've seen on wealth inequality uh, is both Hispanics as well as Blacks. So I'm just gonna say a few things here about the complexity of the data. Uh, I'm teaching a course right now on the political economy of race. And so we've literally just talked about it. It's, you know, uppermost in my mind. When you look at Asians, Asians, uh, sometimes they, they, uh, they refer to the data as a bipolar data uh, in the sense, or it's actually bimodal is the correct term. Um, and that is because you have a number of Asians who are very poor and low income. So Nepalese, Bhutanese, uh, Vietnamese, Cambodians, Laotians, and then you have uh, Asians who are very wealthy, relatively speaking, Japanese, South Koreans, to some extent Chinese and Indians. And so grouping Asians is deeply problematic. And I think if we were to do that for Vermont, we would, you know, the numbers we would get would belie the diversity within the Asian group. And um, so it's just something to be careful of. I would just say, you know, we need to keep that in mind. And then the problem in Vermont is the small numbers of, uh, you know, racial, uh, you know, non-white racial groups. Uh, so even if we wanted to disaggregate in Vermont amongst Asians, we would have a small sample size problem. So I'm not saying we shouldn't do it, but just to kind of, so we're all begin to be educated around the data. The other thing I would say about this is that we know in the United States and certainly in most of the United States, not all, but most, anti-black racism is the most severe form of racism that we, we see. So I've done some, I was an expert witness in a murder case in, in Houston and was asked to analyze their traffic stop data there. And I, I thought that I would see really bad numbers for Hispanics. And in fact, even in, in Texas, um, the, uh, the anti-black racism is much worse than Hispanic racism. So for me, that's why, uh, uh, why using blacks and whites kind of bookends the uh, degree of racism here. Vermont is complex as well in Hispanics because uh, of the, 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 num the percentage is actually very small. So the small numbers problem is really substantial. Uh, so I, I would just say that, that, that's, that that's my spiel on the data. Uh, and I think we have to find our way around that, John, in terms of getting more granularity. So when we talk about Asians in Burlington, we're really talking about Bhutanese and Nepalese. Yes, Nepalese. And, That's and, what I was but, wondering, because at the refugee resettlement and the concentration of right. you know, the, the folks who came from the, the refugee camps in Nepal coming here from Bhutan and Nepal. Exactly. And it's been a concentrated effort. And, you know, so, so I was surprised in the mayor's home ownership thing if we didn't have any data looking at those specific communities. But I, I, I hear what you're, you're saying. And I appreciate that. That's why I asked the question. Sure. Representative Bloomley. Uh, yes. Hello, constituent Seguino. Hi there. Nice to, see you. nice to see you. And um, thanks so much for, I mean, this is very tight. You packed a lot into that and it's very um, helpful in, in understanding kind of the um, 20, 21st century um, experience. I think um, the, I, I really um, agree with the point that you made about tokenism and um, and there is a, and and for that reason, there's a part of 232 at the end that requires reporting on um, what VHCB is learning um, about the barriers um, to land and home ownership and um, and what it is doing. And then um, representatives from uh, VHCB came to um, talk with us. Uh, I don't even know when, I have no sense of time anymore, but, <clears throat> and talked about the fact that that is going to be a part of their reporting from here on in, which was great to hear whether the, the, the bill went through or not. So it's a point well taken. Um, and I wanted to let you know that there was a, um, um, a willing embrace of, 
of of that um, by VHCB. N not to say that that <clears throat> that I mean it doesn't indicate that we've set any particular benchmarks. Um, you know that, but I my sense is that that um, should evolve um, as things move forward. So anyway, thank you. If I could just respond to that, I was really pleased to see that. I did read that at the, I think it was at the very end of the bill. And I thought that that was very good. I thought, I think if you can add any specificity to that language, it might be helpful, but it certainly is a start. I, 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 I really appreciated that that was included there. Representative Murphy. Thank you. I, I neglected to um, just bring forward a point that had struck me when, when you were speaking of some of the exclusive zoning restrictions. I was on our development review board for a dozen years, and here in Fairfax, we, we do have different densities depending on the part of the community. We have a village center and then you know expanding out. And so I never looked at it as being with an intent to restrict ownership that was really trying to build larger property sizes for what we prefer that we like to see the, the land in Vermont. <laughs> but I think it is really important when you, you, you just get a different perspective of, you know, can, can that goal be achieved a different way or, or is that being restrictive or, but just making us think. So yeah. I, I would argue that it's it, minimum lot size in that sense isn't necessarily restrictive through intention um, and, and in some ways has to exist to maintain the goal of having open land if that's the desire of the sure. body. But it's interesting to keep that in the back of your mind though. Yeah, yeah. you know, um, I would just, I would say this in Burlington, I, I don't know much about other cities, but I do know Burlington has inclusionary zoning and it's been interesting to me. I, I've seen a map of where the inclusionary zoning housing, housing has been built, and it's largely not been in the hill section of Burlington. Um, but it is a great tool. It's actually, I think, a very important tool to use. And I, so I will just say one thing, um, Representative Murphy, if I, I can, in response to what you said. Uh, I, um, there, uh, there's a a person you, you may have seen in the news lately, he's written a book on called How to, to Be an Anti-Racist, uh, Ibrahim Kendi. And he, he gave a talk last year, and it's one that I repeat to my students, which is that the issue of race, racism and racial inequality is not, it should, should not be limited to intent. It has to be to impact. So most people, you know, most people carrying out, uh, you know, various policies of their organizations have no intent to discriminate, but we, I think, I guess if there's anything I feel that it is incumbent upon our institutions to take responsibility for the impact of our policies. And so I, um, you know, I was in the school board in Burlington, we developed this mechanism in which we look through everything through an equity lens. So we were in advance uh, evaluating the impact of the policies we had. And so that means you have to have some goals with regard to impact and you can assess that way. Um, and that I think helps us leave aside the issue of intent because there are many good people who don't have uh, racist intentions, but because of past practices and, and cultural norms and so forth, the results are, are have negative effects that we can overcome. Yeah, no, I think that's really important. And I think that goes to the perspective and really trying to look at it from a different viewpoint and, and the, the equity lens is a wonderful tool for that. So thank you. And I um, want to point out too, when it comes to exclusionary zoning, sometimes it's the plus one, right? It's not the zoning and it's on the face of it, it's the loans and the mortgages that, you know, when, when and, and I'll, I think I mentioned this book much earlier on, and I think Stephanie took some of her, and, you know, I, I noticed, I recognized the picture of Macon from the color of law of, of this idea that, you know, Levittown, which was, which was created to be affordable housing for veterans in, after World War II, except African-Americans. And that was in the title of their, you know, that was in the covenants so that plus one, which really, you know, I think 
it, it addresses something that that when you don't know about it, we just think, oh, look, this is Levittown. This was great. This was for veterans. And it becomes part of our culture without knowing why it was so exclusionary. And I, but I, Stephanie, you, you've used a lot of national stuff because that's what's mostly available. But what struck me today more than anything else is the minuscule number of, of black American homeowners in Burlington. And I don't think it's enough to say, why is that? Because I think the answer might be because of all of this, but that's shocking to me. And it really gives the picture of um, the work that we've done earlier this year, not specifically for black Americans, but just about, about different ethnicities and how they've been treated throughout the years. But that is, I mean, I, 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 I don't live in Burlington. I know it's close to Vermont, but what's the reaction within Burlington to, to something like that? Has there been something? I mean, I know that this legislation and other things that have happened in Burlington, have, uh, this, is the, this is one of the reasons why this legislation is in front of us, both of these bills. Um, what, what do Burlingtonians and other Vermonters, but what do Burlingtonians think about that fact? Um, I, you know, I think that Burlington is in a particular moment in its history. And it's, it's struggling even with the race data. There is you know, a real political divide in terms of those who think that, um, that um, the, excess, the use of force on uh, black citizens is four times greater than their share of the city's population. I mean, the numbers are just extraordinary. And even there, I don't really see an outcry amongst some and of course, some are very disturbed. So I think this city is in the process of a kind of a racial awakening and that the data are fundamentally important. And you know, to your point, uh, Representative Stevens, I think that this data on home ownership by Blacks in Burlington is a, a wake up call. So, but it's in the process of being absorbed by a community uh, and I will say that Burlington is no different than the rest of the state in which a lot of white people think very highly of us. And we have a hard time absorbing this information because it's not consistent with our good perception of ourselves. And so um, I think Representative Stevens, that some of us, th that, that number really hit us. And for others, um, it's just business as usual. And, and we are just, you know, you, as you know, there's a lot going on in Burlington around race. And we're just in that process of trying to educate a lot of people in the city and hopefully move forward. And, and I know I made light of the, the classic Burlington joke, but I, I bring it out only because those of us who don't live in Burlington may think that it's only a Burlington problem. And I, while the numbers may be lower in each of the different counties, um, I think it's important for us to acknowledge that it's not a Burlington only or Chittenden County only problem. Right. You know, I, um, I actually probably should contact the nearest office, but I think because they have uh, property data, they are able to come up with that number, but it seems to me, so should Brattleboro be able to, uh, so should Rutland. So some of the larger towns, and, uh, and, and that means looking not maybe only on black home, home ownership, but Hispanics and so on and so forth. So I think it would be a great service if some entity would seek out that data from individual municipalities so that we had a picture, um, as you said, to show that this isn't just a Burlington phenomenon because it, it very, it, I'm very doubtful that it is just a Burlington phenomenon. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I appreciate the the um, the presentation, and certainly, if you can share those slides with us, so that we can keep them um, for our record. Excuse me, that would be um, that would be great. Thank you for your time. You're very welcome. Um, Thank you very much. All right, and we'll. Um, no, I pre this was really good stuff. Thank you. Thank you all. It was nice to talk to you. All right, um, committee, I'm gonna ask um, you to stick around for a minute after we go off the air. 
Um, and Ron, I think we can just go, well, before we go off the air, just, um, that was um, pretty eye-opening stuff. And I think I just want to give a context to the testimony that we're taking. We are spending a lot of time on these bills and much like the testimony we took this morning, there it's testimony that's not necessarily specifically related to um, the, the the testimony this morning wasn't specifically related to a bill as these as this was and and we have one more set of witnesses tomorrow on two thirty two. Uh, but I, I the reason I'm spending so much time with this right now is is that this is clearly um, an element of our work that. Um, I have to admit, I haven't dealt with personally in this committee. We've always treated it as a class issue. Poor people are poor people, and you know the housing is created for 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 poor people and and people have been living in poverty wherever they are, and that's not necessarily incorrect. But there's also elements that we ignore when we don't take into account the different um, facets of of the individual Vermonters who are being affected by the policies that we're promulgating. And that we do, we do our, and I know that we do. When it comes to housing, we we do our best, and we, we think we do our best, um, and yet we end up in a situation which we just heard about in Burlington. So it's just I'm just trying to give us a background. This is the frustration of only having two year bienniums. Um, you know, this is background for and for work that, um, again, even those of us who have been on the committee for for a couple of terms or more haven't done this deep a dive on this kind of information. Um, so I, that's really where I'm coming from in, in making sure that we hear this testimony so that it informs our work moving forward.